This podcast is sponsored big time by the Union Street in Berwick, Nova Scotia. Nestled in the gorgeous Annapolis Valley, the Union Street stands out as a legendary venue and restaurant to its community and travelers alike. I think it's the best live sound of any venue for your money in Nova Scotia. Incredible place to see a band or a solo artist or even stand-up comedy. What? Throw in some great food with locally sourced ingredients and a beautiful history of being family-run by lovely people. The Union Street is for everybody. Come to the Annapolis Valley. Come to the Union Street. Hey, why not even come to one of our live recordings there? What the what? This place has it all. See you there. There it is. Welcome, 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 welcome to The Friendly Heckler, my friends. I'm Zachary Miller. I'm your host. This is episode five. We made it. That's right. Five episodes in. We've had some lovely guests. We've had some great guests. And we're just going to keep getting better and better and better. That's right. I have uh, I have invited some close friends and I'm just branching out and I'm getting some crazy guests lined up for the future. So definitely keep listening definitely keep in touch hey email me and tell me who i should have who you want me to have who do you want to be on this hey send me an email this is uh I, you can reach me at the friendly heckler at gmail.com that's right the friendly heckler at gmail.com um i don't know what to say it's going great so far i'm loving doing this uh i'm having a great time i'm talking too much in general on stage i love it though i think my guests hate it but i think they're having a great time too we've had lots of giggles on stage so it's, it's going well so far i think um this week i'm bringing to you this month i guess I'm bringing to you... I want to do this more than once a month. That's why I'm stuttering on that. Because I can only do this once a month due to audience sizes. You know, it's hard to bring people out in the middle of the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia twice a month. But I think, you know, if the word really gets out there and uh, we keep increasing our population by 100% a year like we are here in Nova Scotia, we could do this twice a month. Hell, we could do this once every week, friends. Maybe even in different venues. Again, send me that email and let's start lining that up. But, again, I want to get back to my guest this month. A close friend of mine, actually. Someone I've gotten the real pleasure uh, to know over the years. Pretty pretty close. We've played a lot of games of cribbage. Uh, we've uh, he, he taught me how to play dominoes, actually, and he dominates me in that game. <laughs> oh, uh, he's a real sharp mind. He's a real close friend and a real sweet person. So I want to introduce you... The listener, if you don't know him already, to Graham Nicholas. Um, he's amazing. This guy is the reason that I started performing under my own name at all in the first place. Um, I saw him do his thing, and I was just blown away. And I thought, this is such a beautiful art form. His ability to connect with an audience was just like, ah, it's just astounding. He's really sweet. And it comes across on stage, which is hard to do. So I'm so glad Graham gets to be on this podcast because really and again even though he's the inspiration for me getting out there and writing in the first place he's also partially the inspiration for this podcast because he heckled me as i was heckling chris robison so it's a real it's a real circle of uh, of heckling here a, a, a heckler's five five heckles of hell i don't know i'm going somewhere with it but i'll figure it out um He's got a, an album coming out, actually. Graham Nicholas has an album coming out on April 4th, 2023. It's called Black Creek. He's promoting that on this podcast, but he's also just playing some of his golden oldies. So uh, I just want to i want to get to it. A warm Burke welcome to Graham Nicholas. I'm going to play this because Jim was mad at me when I didn't play it at the last show.
mountain flower, how it grows. Seasons come and seasons go, but still you'll be my mountain rose. The rivers run, that river flows. Far below my mountain road, up above the moon, it does go way down upon my mountain road. Oh, mountain flower, mountain rose, mountain flower, oh, how it grows. Seasons come and seasons go, but still you be my mountain rose. Your colors shine, or so I'm told. Shades of purple, crimson, and gold, such sights unseen. Since long ago, the colors of my mountain rose, oh mountain flower, mountain rose, mountain flower, oh how it grows. Seasons come and seasons go. Will still you be? You grow weary, you grow cold, you get lonely, all alone. What do you long for? Will I long know? Well, do you miss me? My mountain road, oh mountain flower, mountain rose, mountain flower. How it grows, seasons come and seasons go, but still you'll be my mountain road, and still you'll be my mountain road. <laughs> nice. Oh, spicy finish on such a beautiful song. This whole thing? <laughs> now, if only the podcast listeners Every country could see, song ends like that. <laughs> if, you, if only the podcast listeners could see how you like waved your hand to get your drink afterwards. Like, oh, don't <laughs> mind if I do. Oh, yes. <laughs> After that. Hello, Graham. Hey, Zach. What's up? <laughs> Welcome. Not too much. As I said, we know each other very well. Yes. Uh, we've talked. That's why I'm so nervous. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Oh, my God. Where are you from? Uh, Toronto. Toronto originally. Yeah, big smoke. The big smoke. Big folks. O. I consider you more of just like an Ontarian in general because of you've lived in a few places in Ontario, too. Like Not really. You lived in London for a little I like, did live in London, Ontario for a little bit. And because some people would say, like, eh, Tobacco's not Toronto. Um, well, you, you grew up in Etobicoke in Toronto. That's true. But for the record, I did grow up on the subway line. So that counts. That counts. As <laughs> right. being in Toronto. I could get home as I a kid. I could get home from downtown. That makes me a Toronto As a teenager. <laughs> right, right. And then you went to high school in. Uh, Oakville. <laughs> okay, okay. And then you uh, graduated university in... 
Yeah, let's get all these out of the way first. Yeah, I that's gotta, what I'm thinking. Yeah, let's just, uh, in I, London, I went to the University okay. of London. Yeah, see, that's why I see you as just an Ontarian. You're like a graduate of yeah, Ontario to me. Southern Ontario boy. Yeah, and yeah. just like, to me, yeah, yeah, we just know each other from Ontario too, I guess. Yeah. Now, you, uh, we got to know each other at the Cameron House, I guess, as I mentioned. The rumors are true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, you were my favorite place. That it, do you say not my favorite place? No, I said or, at yeah, my favorite place. At my place. favorite place. Yeah, okay, yeah. I was like, wow, that's a revelation. <laughs> I've never heard this before about you. But yes, the Cameron House. Yeah, you were a big part of that scene when I was starting to go out and see live music. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, when I moved back to Toronto after finishing school in London, Ontario, and I was like, school's stupid. I don't know what I'm going to do. <laughs> I also got a philosophy degree, so I didn't know what to do with that at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, you've done a lot, I'd say. But, yeah, I remember, I don't remember why I went there at first, but I remember going to the Cameron House for the first time and being like, I can't believe that this is here. <laughs> who was, do you remember who was playing when you I first I think I saw in? Corin Raymond first. Oh, wow, okay. Yeah. And um, You were already writing songs at this point, too? Yes, yeah. When did you start writing that stuff? I must have been like 19 or 20, and uh, I started writing. I had quit playing guitar. Why? Because I just wasn't feeling it. As a kid, you had quit playing? Well, like late teen, teen years, I stopped What did playing. you learn on guitar at first? Like, what well, was the stuff know, that you were... chords, and like, I wasn't a great player, so I just like kind of had put it aside, and it was collecting dust for quite a while. Right. And um, then... I guess I met a lot of really creative, cool people and like great musicians when I was living there. And one of my friends, I remember she was opening for uh, this artist from Winnipeg, Del Barber. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, I went to that show. And when I saw Del play, I was like, oh, I, I want to do that. Del hooked you. Del hooked me. Del hooked you like you hooked me. Yes. <laughs> you get the, the songwriter poison. Yeah, so you're Del's grandchild. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Del, if only you knew, sir. I don't know. Maybe yeah, you might listen to this. I Just like my real grandfather. I don't but, know him. Yeah, I remember watching him play, and he was like, he had so many good stories, and his lyrics were so good. And I was just like, I could I think I could do that. <laughs> right, yeah. But it's an, an admiration, like an, it's oh, yeah. an admiration. Yeah, I wasn't like, shit, like, oh. I could do that. <laughs> yeah. It was yeah. more like, I want to do that. Yeah. And I think I went home and like wrote a song that night. That night? Yeah. You, had you never written anything before other than like no. classes as a kid where you're like, write down your dreams and a rhyming <laughs> I mean, song. yes, I've written essays. If that was, yeah. That's what I you're asking. Know. I, actually, <laughs> but no, I've never written songs. When you were I, writing essays. I was doing creative writing though. Oh, like storytelling. <clears throat> yeah, I thought I was going to be a writer. Wow, I could see that, because you read a lot as a kid, didn't you? Yeah, and I still read a lot. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you should. You, I, anybody out there <laughs> should see Graham's bookshelves. It's insane, and I feel like he could give an entire bookshelf. bookshelf. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you could give an entire bookshelf to a library, and they would, they would thank you immensely, but then you'd look, turn around, and there'd still be another bookshelf <laughs> for the books. Uh, yeah, I thought I was going to... I really wanted to be like a creative writer, but I'm glad that I'm not. Uh, I still think you should try it. Well, maybe I will, but hmm. I remember I was talking to someone. She was a publisher, uh, I think for Penguin in uh, Toronto. Yeah. And she was talking about how she would go to these writers' conferences, and they were all very stuffy and boring. And then I would tell her about the music conferences, and she'd be like, that sounds way more fun. I was like, yeah. <laughs> Stick to your scene. <laughs> yeah, there's beer in all the bathtubs. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, people bring, like, slow cookers full of pork to well, put on buns in the middle of the shows. No, and... I hear the Woody Point Writers Festival gets a little crazy <laughs> like that in Newfoundland. Maybe, uh, maybe so, those are yeah, There's something a little more, uh, you know, social about music, which... You know, I was, like I said, I was doing a philosophy degree at the time, so I was locked up in the, the ivory tower. Yeah. And yeah. I needed someone to bust me out. Wow, Dell. I, I guess Dell busted me out. That's awesome. <laughs> what kind of writer did you want to be? What, what were you reading? You know, I was writing, like, short stories. and. Who were you like, that's what I'm going to... When I was, like, 20? Yeah. Uh, I really like Richard Ford. Okay. Oh, we got, there's a Richard we got Ford a, we got fan a Richard in the Ford house. Ford fan. I, someone just went, Yes! Richard Ford! 
<laughs> Sorry, nobody said that. Yeah, I remember reading those books around then and being like, oh. Man. Were you a Vonnegut guy back then? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah, see, I could see being but very Vonnegut. But he's too smart. I couldn't write anything like that. Oh, get <laughs> off your low horse, pal. You are, you belong on the high horse. <laughs> I think so. Like, I've always admired your writing. I think you are a great Thank storyteller you. in song, which is why I think you should write a book. But can I bother you it's to play? It's more fun to write, like, a little movie that lasts two minutes. It really is a movie. Yeah. Wait, you've never made a music video, though. Have, uh, you've made videos of your music, yeah, like, like I've seen live, live footage. performance yeah. videos. But no, I've never done a music video. Ooh. I don't have the money. <laughs> yeah, do any of us? No. Maybe this podcast, let's find a wealthy benefactor <laughs> who wants to see one of Graham's incredible stories turned into song. Can I bother you to tell an I've incredible story? I've had good story? ideas. I'm going to bother yeah. you. I'm going to heckle you right I now. I've never like, had the money. I'm telling you to, s to play a song right now. Okay, what song? I think... <laughs> I think... <laughs> it's your birthday, so I'll play one. Right, you right. Yeah, I forgot it's my birthday and I can yell if I want to. <laughs> I'm going to request... Can I request drinking problems? Yeah. Uh, actually, well, yeah, let's do drinking problems because this isn't a great storytelling song, but I just think this is the kind of wordplay that baffles There's me with you. There's wordplay. This is There's incredible wordplay. There's one verse that sort of lets you into someone's life there. Mm, I, yeah. Please. I wrote this. Uh, I carried a notebook all the time to go see shows because I would go to shows like every night. You still almost do. I go to everything I can here, but... There was a lot more going on in Toronto, I'm not going to lie. Yeah, well, going and out every night is unhealthy, but go on. I, I know. I think, it, I think I, it was a little unhealthy. I was staying up really late every night, spending all my money. You look great, though, Thank considering, you. I must say, for Thank someone with you. no money or But I was, at a, uh, I was at the, um, the Cadillac Lounge, RIP Cadillac Lounge. Goodbye. Great uh, music venue in Parkdale, which was my neighborhood back in the day. In Tirana. In Tirana. And uh, I was at the, uh, there was a band called Big Tobacco and the Pickers. Mm, they still are a great band. They are a great band. And um, yeah, I wrote this, like watching them. Woo! Not all of it, but I yeah. like started it. And then I remember uh, like a year or so later, Jamie Oliver, who's the lead singer, not the chef, but he has the same name as the oh, famous British chef. He can whip up a spicy tune, I'll but tell Jamie you But Oliver walked up and he was like, hey, I really like that song, Drinking Problems. And I was like, well, thanks, because I wrote it at your show watching you play. Figures, <laughs> no wonder. Please play for everybody, Drinking Problems. I'll also say that the idea for this came because um, Keith Richards, this is true, I did, I don't just say this on stage, but Keith Richards <laughs> has this quote that says, um, I don't have a drug problem. I have a police problem. And I was like, how did you not write a song with that amazing line? <laughs> <laughs> like, you're a songwriter. And so I was like, yoink, I'll take that. So then I wrote this song. It's called, you know, I don't have a drinking problem, just a problem with the bill. <laughs> I drink to the good times and I drink to the bad. Well, I've raised a glass to every single time that I ever had. They say you can't find happiness at the bottom of your glass. So I fill my right up to the top just to make those good times last. Now say about me what you will. Cause I've been drinking, I'm drinking still. I don't have a drinking problem, just a problem with the bill. Well, the day after the night before, oh, well, it always burns too bright. Oh, and all of those things left in the dark have been pulled into the light. And I lie alone, awake in bed, and I try hard not to think. 
how the daylight be it won't burn so bright when I pass right out from drink. Now see about me what you will. Cause I've been drinking, I'm drinking still. I don't have a drinking problem, just a problem with the bill. Cute. Get in, get out. It's <laughs> yeah. Cool. yeah, that's like tasty old time country kind of thing, you know. Here's like the sweet pun. Here's the tale that well, tells it. Well, that's the I, that's the 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 idea of of country music. You know, songwriting usually uh, the the thesis is the is the chorus. It's your sort of central word play. Right. And then every verse is like your supporting arguments. Contrast and compare for the rest <laughs> of it. <laughs> it's true, though. You know, you have to like have a metaphor to hang the hat on. Yeah. Yeah. For the whole gig. I, I think you're show. a master of that. Uh, it I comes and goes. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. I have good it's, days and I have bad days, but that was a good one. <laughs> I love that song, man. I love that song. And that was off, uh, which album was that off of? Sometimes Chicken? No, that was on Dial Tones. Dial Tones, which was your second to last record. You're a, you just put a new one, too. Well, it's coming out on February uh, 4th. I wrote that down just in case. <laughs> guy, yeah. I love that you did the lean for it, February 4th. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm, fourth, rather. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. Yeah, but when I recorded it, I regret not I regret not making it like a barroom country song. We made it like a ballad. Right. And it sounds cool, and it's got 12-string guitar, and it sounds really pretty. Is there any pedal steel? No, there's no, no pedal steel on that. But, but I yeah, really I wish. It. I was like, the song just wants to be a barroom country song. Just you could it. always do it three albums down. I love the changing Maybe. of the tune. I've done that once where I recycled a song. Yeah, which song was that that you did? Uh, Penny? No. Oh, well. You did it with Penny. Oh, you did it twice. That's okay. <laughs> yes, that's true, but I then, don't count that because that was like a demo EP. Oh, okay. But I did I recycle a song from my first record, and it's called Keep My Soul Alive, and I redid it on the new Dial Tones and Pretty Notes. Amazing. Yeah. Oh, that was a, that was, you pulled that out of the woodworks, eh? I didn't yeah, realize that. Yeah, I liked that one, and I did a really bad job on it the first time, so I thought I deserved a second kick at the can. So you just <laughs> need a few years to sit on drinking problems. Maybe. I remember watching, actually, I have a, I, rem- I have a memory of you playing at Not My Dog in Toronto. R.I.P. Not My Dog. Great little bar. It was the <laughs> size, it was like a, maybe an eighth the size of it this room. It was like your living room. Yeah. One of the things I loved about that bar is that it was so small that you would just walk in and you were like hanging out with everyone. Yeah. Because you'd just be like, like It felt like it was 10 by 10. <laughs> And uh, so you could just go alone, and then you'd be forced to be... It'd be like uh, you're at a house party all of a sudden. And you guys played in the window, so as yeah. soon as you walked in the door, you were in the band, and the you were sort of sitting there like, like, oh, hi, guys. the venue. <laughs> yeah. It was a great spot. And I remember walking in and seeing you play um, They Ought to Name a Drink After You, oh, the yeah. John Prine song. Great song. And there was a guy at the bar that they ought to have named a drink after yeah. who had clearly Maybe been I there every night. dedicated it to him. I, maybe, because he was loving it, and it just felt like, wow, I am in the moment that this song was written in. Graham's <laughs> capturing John Prine. That guy is very emotional. This is Toronto, West End. It, it, it was intense. It was amazing. I mean, that is kind of an attribute of most Toronto bars. Is no one, I mean, in Toronto in general, no one is, um, no one is precious about their space because they have none. <laughs> That's a city thing. So, yeah. yeah. And I get that. My dad always I said think I appreciate that a lot that more. Canadians were space hogs anyway, and like yeah. we all just take too much. <laughs> I was uh, back in Toronto like two weeks ago or three weeks ago for a wedding. For a wedding, lovely wedding. And I was on the subway, and you know, like the subway seats, they they are some sections of it are shaped like an L. So if you're sitting in the, the corner of the L, you can use the seat in front of you like a table, <laughs> which people do all the time. Okay. And there was this guy, and he was rolling a blunt. Nice. And it was like crowded on the like subway. like weed in a cigar. Yeah. Okay. And yeah, I know what a blunt. No, I just wanted to clarify. What a blunt is. So, we're on a podcast. <laughs> Some people don't know what that is. And he had like Some a, people think it's a big joint. But I just like that. When you're in the city, it's just like, look, I don't have anywhere to do this, and I got to roll this. Yeah. And so we're gonna get it done together. And he borrowed a pen from someone, <laughs> and they were like, yeah, just take the pen. Yeah. And it was like a real community effort. <laughs> And I feel like if that happened here, we'd be like, what the hell is that guy doing? You know? 
So it was just nice Maybe. to be back in the city and just see people being like, look, this is who I am. So unapologetically, yeah. Yeah. you know, it's nice. You know, there are more cannabis users here than there are in Toronto, Yeah, right? but they're not rolling them on the bus. If there was a bus, <laughs> they might be, but there's no bus. Everyone, so that's has, the the, everyone has their own table here. They've got a house <laughs> yeah, that's and true. field and a yard. No, I think yeah, like people can very living on top of people in the city. You ever tried to roll a joint and move an F-150, bud? It's friggin' hard, I'll tell you what. <laughs> yeah, but that's a private space. That's yeah, my point. Yeah, the roads and the potholes, you can like spill a lot of weed right now. <laughs> the subway's for everyone, is what I'm saying. Yes, yeah. So, and you missed that. You and it missed was a that. joint effort. Oh! Oh, wow. Well. Thank you. Yeah, anyone. clap. Everybody clap for that. <laughs> There's, see... We even practice laughter before the podcast starts, and you folks are still holding back. <laughs> um, yeah, when, do you want to play another one for us? No, you, we just play. We keep talking. You have any other <laughs> okay. questions? Uh, oh, uh, yes. When you get to heaven, oh my God, what no, do you I'm want so... God to say no, to you? Not if God that. exists. <laughs> not doing the Prue questionnaire. Yeah. <laughs> that's, up, right? that's just inside the actor's studio. Yeah, but it's from the Pru the Proust questionnaire. He just stole the Proust? Really? Yeah. Isn't that right? No, James Lipton has his <laughs> own questionnaire. And it lives on as the Lipton questionnaire. Oh. I don't know. We'll have to look it up. I don't want to debate this. All with right, you. let's play something. <laughs> Please, play me something. What do you want me to play? I want you to choose one this time. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Let's do, well, this is one you ch asked me to play. Really? Yeah. Oh, so I don't even have to heckle you it? No. Nope. Oh, that's great. Thank this you. Is for this your is, birthday. You're so friendly that you friendly heckled the friendly heckler. Oh, <laughs> <gasps> is this a new one? Yeah. Okay. Okay. This is off of Graham's <laughs> new album, and I just, I heard him play the song, and I was like blown away. I did not, I thought it was a Guy Clark song or something when I first heard wow, it, okay, actually. Yeah, it just I'm already on your show, Zach. You don't have to <laughs> wine and dine me anymore. Listen, I'm going to wine, dine, and 69 you. I don't care what it takes, Zach. sir. I don't care what it takes to have you back on this show. Oh, the internet's a wild place. <laughs> yeah, things happen. You know, AI can generate a photo of it, but we won't go there. I thought this was an amazing song. I just loved it. I'm so, cutting you off. Thank you. <laughs> Sink me. What's it called? It's called Venice is, Venice is Sinking. Which I know uh, Spirit of the West already wrote a song called Venice is Sinking. And people say that to me a lot. And I'm like, okay, that's true. But this is totally different. About Venice sinking and I never got to San Marcos Square. I never got that postcard that says you'll meet me there. Now the pigeons fly high above what was so long ago grand Because Venice is sinking, maybe now they got no place to land Well the gondoliers sang their songs from long ago they ring out like lovers' footsteps walking across the marble stone. Now there's a silence that's so golden you could hang it from a church tower bell. Or off the coast of your eyelids, baby, you could hang there just as well. And how strange to find a road like this in a dimly lit bar down on that main street strip where you lean across the table just to give me a kiss while the band they rock so hard that the stage it almost tipped So tired, couldn't carry these burdens if I tried. It's like taking one last look as I cross that bridge of sighs. One last look is all you get, so you 
better take it fast Shine a light through your diamond Count those colors as they pass Send me down that canal Till I'm washed away at sea So I can watch the sun set down on Where Venice used to be Down the starlit back road Around the bend across the river's wide Or in the empty parking lots Under neon motel signs how strange to find a rose in a place like this In a dimly lit bar down on that main street strip Where you lean across the table just to give me a kiss While the band they rock so hard that the stage it almost tipped It's such a great song. Thank you. It's a great new album, too. <laughs> Graham gave me a sneak peek of his new album, guys. I got the secret download link. That's true. I'll send it out to you, all you friendly no, no. podcast <laughs> listeners out there. Uh, <laughs> yeah, that one Patreon came. supporters. Sometimes songs, they're like, oh, you have one clear idea, and you're like, that's exactly what I'm going to write the song about. And this came from like a million different places. <laughs> oh, wow. No thesis. No thesis. This hmm. is not a country song. <laughs> Were you struck by climate but there was, change? There was a central metaphor, I guess, of, you know, yeah, Venice sinking. <laughs> was it after you saw the footage of Italy that you were like, well... Well, you know, yeah, is... I heard that story about how there was a city council meeting in Venice about, you know, whether or not they should invest in these, like, global warming preventative measures, and they all voted it down, and then, like, as soon as that happened, the city council chambers flooded, and it was, like, the worst flood that Venice had ever had. Yeah. And uh, so I was like, well, that's funny. <laughs> oh, right, yeah. What about, about the that. pigeons? Where <laughs> yeah, are, where are the gonna pigeons going to live? I thought that was so considerate of you. <laughs> thank you. I like that line, so thank you. Yeah. Um, You're the only one worrying about them. And they're rock doves, by the way. They're called <laughs> <No>. rock doves. <laughs> <laughs> but, so I was thinking about that, and then I was sort of also thinking about, you know, like just sort of, I used it as like a metaphor as like old world charms kind of disappearing. You know, yeah. and like being in Toronto and like seeing things gentrify and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the one kind of like Toronto specific reference in there is in the chorus where he said, where he says, I said it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, how, the, the, how strange to find a rose in a place like this. Yeah. In a dimly lit bar on the downtown strip. Yeah. Because maybe you remember, but there used to be these, these gentlemen, if you were like hanging out. Mm -hmm at the Imperial, at Young and Dundas, or at the, uh, we're just going to... Even on College Street on in College Little Street, Italy. Oh, my God, Italy, yeah. Or uh, I saw them, they'd come to the Rivoli or the Cameron House. Yeah. They'd walk in with armloads of roses. Fake roses, fake, sometimes. Sometimes fake. Most of sometimes the they weren't. Yeah, well, Most of the times they were. Those guys were good. And uh, they would try and sell you, they would solicit you to buy a rose in the bar. And you're like, if I'm you... just here getting a beer, man. Like, how'd you get in here? Like, <laughs> yeah. They just let them in anywhere. If, even if you were alone, not if you were on a date, even if you were alone, they'd still come up to you and be like, Rose, you, like you know, rose? $15 oh, is yes. a pretty good price. Yes, yes come on. If you <laughs> were on a date, it was really bad. Yeah. Though. <laughs> Which was nice, because if you were on a date, you could just be like, well, I'll get a rose when I get there. I don't have to prepare at all. Yeah, I'll just, <laughs> I'll just buy you a fake rose at the Rivoli. What's she going to say, eh? <laughs> Someone bought me a fake rose at the Rivoli, I'd marry them. Well, you wrote a song about it, so yeah, of course and you And yeah, would. so I guess I wrote that maybe during COVID. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah. So I then I was like, oh, I wonder if those rose guys are going to come back. Oh, after that so, song, you just gave them a theme song. They're going to march into <laughs> the... I hope so. Yeah, to Venice's sinking. So yeah, did we lose them, you know? Is no. Venice sunk? 
Uh, almost. <laughs> I think it's three quarters of the way there, right? It's most of the way. <laughs> it's the new Atlantis, I've heard. Right. Yeah, it's too bad. And then I was reading this book. This is another thread. This is how my mind works <laughs> for writing a song sometimes. I was reading this book called American Gods. Have you read that? Anyone no. read that? Neil Gaiman? Somebody has. Who, who, by who? And, uh, Neil Gaiman. Oh, okay, yeah. And the idea of it is so funny, which I like the idea of it. It's about all these old world gods living in America, and they're like forgotten, like washed up. And it's sort of like, uh, it's just really funny to see like Odin like complaining about traffic. Like, I don't know. <laughs> right. Did they turn that into a TV show? I feel like they did. Yeah. I think, okay, cool. But anyway, so that was kind of kicking around my head, and I was like, oh. This all fits. All these puzzle pieces fit. Is that the first time that's ever happened to you, too, where a song just kind of like, this is all the angles of no, that happens I've been all writing the time. about? Okay. Yeah. I'd say it's less often that you get one really strong idea, and you're like, Because you're, you're Because when you do, that's when, you, that's when I write a song really quickly. Yeah, you're a very determined writer in my eyes. Like, I see you sit down, and you, you don't stop until it's finished, it seems. <sighs> I'd like to say Yes. I would say I've been very bad at that lately. Oh, lately? Yeah. With the newest material that you haven't even released yet? Yeah. That you haven't even recorded yet? Well, yeah. I'm still <laughs> writing. <laughs> yeah, I know you're still <laughs> writing. But I love that you're hard on yourself. You're about to release an album, and you're like, I've been bad about writing well, material. Well, you can't right stop. Now. I know you can't. Well, yeah, but so, especially you, you sicko. I have been thinking about this lately, though, because it's like maybe I'm scared that the better I get, the worse I get. Uh, I'm bad at math, but that doesn't make any <laughs> sense. We'll carry the one. <laughs> and we'll check this out together. The but better you get, the worse you get. Like, the more time you spend at it? No, I just get afraid that I say no too quickly to myself. To ideas. Yeah. Because I'm like, that doesn't fly. Like, I'm too hard. You, yeah. Because when I you're not that, that experienced, you say yes to every idea you come up with. But you'll come back to it when your brain starts to atrophy. At some point, when I you're like, hope you're, you're right. going to wear yourself down. <laughs> Look, Whether it's still, in 30 they're years. They're still in here. Is this your songbook that you have on stage? Yeah. Can I rifle through no. this? <laughs> yeah. Is, that's a doodle of me in the front. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's an idea in here. Oh, that you haven't even written yet. Yeah, probably. I, I think that's fascinating. Maybe. You're off microphone right now, so nobody knows that you're muttering oh, to yourself. Okay, like, nope. <laughs> <laughs> He's actually reading them in like a golem voice. <laughs> precious. My precious. Yes. <laughs> Which, I mean, were you a token guy? You're a token guy in general. Are you saying Tolkien? Tolkien guy. Uh, yeah, when I was a kid, I loved J.R.R. Tolkien. Yeah. Were you more science fiction than you were? <laughs> I love this. All right, yeah, let's talk about you're, reading. Are you a sci-fi? Like, are you yeah, I like sci-fi. fantasy or sci-fi? Okay, here's, we're gonna draw the here's line. what happened to my reading tastes in the last couple of years. Oh, recent. When COVID happened and everything shut down, yeah. I like couldn't focus on like real life literature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, like the rest does. Okay. I just couldn't like read Falk like a Faulkner book. Okay. I couldn't read, you know. What about like Dickens? Yeah, I couldn't read Dickens. Whoa. <laughs> That's big for you. Okay. But uh, I, so I was like, I need something that I'm just going to like get taken away by. So I got into like fantasy and sci-fi. Is this when you started reading Neil Gaiman too? Yeah, I read Neil Gaiman during the okay. pandemic. How many Steve Neil Gaiman books did you read during the pandemic? Only two. Okay. The other one wasn't very good. That's, <laughs> that's still four times more than I am. Um, you aren't good at math, are you? <laughs> I told you. I told you once, and I'll tell you another 11 or 18 times. But, yeah, so I just needed a real break. So, yeah, that's why I got into, like, genre fiction. Mm. But yeah. fantasy over sci-fi. I, no, I read some sci-fi. I read Did some you? Ursula K. Le Guin. <laughs> I don't know who that is. And uh, some of the Foundation books. Uh, Elrond? No. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, Asimov? Okay, oh, right, right. I took Asimov. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I was like, dude, you got into Scientology during the pandemic? You went deep, brother. Yeah, I'm going to convert you tonight. Tonight? Yeah, That's this fine. Is my podcast now. <laughs> okay, Let's right. measure your thetans. <laughs> right. No, I didn't get into uh, Scientology, <laughs> for the record. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no. Until Will Smith is on this podcast, we're not a Scientology <laughs> podcast. But when he does come on for one night only... <laughs> the friendly I can't, Elrond. I can't wait. I'll okay. be in the audience. <laughs> 
I know you will because you've been to every one. Yes. Ladies and gentlemen, if there was a stamp card for this podcast, which we're talking about making, <laughs> Graham's got like full card. He's got two cards. He's waiting to collect his free one. Actually, tonight is free for Graham. He got it for free tonight. <laughs> so it works out. It you're works getting out. paid? Did I get paid? No, but no. Uh, we'll talk about that after. Of course you're getting paid. This is a live show. Um, I believe in paying the artist properly, don't you? Yes. Yeah, that's a firm belief. Yeah. We've talked... I think we could agree on that. ...so much about like fairness in venues and in the industry. Yes, we have. And I got to say, I like the way that you... It's maybe one of the times we fought. Yeah, well, yeah. I don't, <laughs> I don't, we don't have to go there, but yeah, I fucking hate the music industry. I think it's silly. But... You play the game well. I think you play the game with class and dignity. Like you put out your records, you self fund your records. Yes. You work it. I didn't once. What with like a bit of a grant or something? <coughs> no, I, I did a GoFundMe once when I was young, and I regretted it. <laughs> Why? Why did you regret it? <laughs> I lo- the look on your face is so serious. Because right it involves face. too many people in the process, mm. and everyone had opinions about how I should make things and what I should do. Did they? How dare they? On a GoFundMe? Yep. <laughs> what? Like, what kind of opinions? Like, I think you should have mandolin on every song. I'm just trying to figure out how much I should say. Oh, okay. Okay. As but long as... Okay. People... Because I was making, like, a public... Like, fine. Like, a public kind of display of trying to make a record. Yeah. There's no one right way to do it. Absolutely. And if it's going to be put in kind of everybody's eye about the pro- if the process is going to be in front of everyone, you're just inviting opinions that you might not necessarily want. Yeah, yeah. Even <laughs> producers, yeah. I feel that way sometimes working with other people. Which I haven't. No, I've always worked with good people. These were yeah. these weren't pe- these weren't these were just people being yeah. mad at me for like we don't I don't <laughs> we don't have to go there we don't have but to yeah. go there but I, again. You, you so did, yeah, you've done then, most of your albums alone. Since then, I have done the old envelope under the mattress. Oh, it's amazing. And stuffed away cash. It's amazing. Just to make my records. And you've worked with great producers, and the albums sound great. If you guys haven't heard I've worked Graham's with one great albums, producer every time. Boom. Boom. <laughs> okay. Aaron Como is who I work with all the time. The Aaron show. Como yeah. of trailer fame. Yes, he did have a studio called The Trailer. And he's a great guitarist and writer himself. He's great at everything. Yeah. He's a, a wonderful piano player, which I think is what he primarily thinks of himself as. Because mm. he considers himself a musician, not, an, like a, not a producer engineer. He is a musician first. You know, you'll yeah, have to get Aaron. him on the that's show. That's for Aaron. I can't wait to have <laughs> you on the show, Aaron. But I know you're going to listen to this. You better listen to this, Aaron. I love working with Aaron because... Yeah. He is my favorite musician. Uh, there are a lot of musicians who have a lot of talent and like no taste, right? Or have more talent than taste. They still yeah. have it, but yeah, Aaron is like rich, uh, embarrassingly rich in in taste. Yeah, and you guys had similar influences in the first place, almost right, in terms of like what you heard in your head for certain I records. I think so. I mean, yeah, he's on his own musical mm-hmm. path. <laughs> It's brilliant. His music is brilliant and a lot different than what I do, but yeah, his brain fascinates me totally. Yeah, yeah. me too. Yeah. I so this record, to this. <laughs> we'll he just... played some parts on this record that you're about yeah. like to put out, right? He played like, on it a lot. He played. I I heard some piano. I was listening he to. He played it today, piano, too. mandolin, and guitar. Wow. And he adds so much melody to the songs. Which yes. does he write a lot of those melodies? Yeah. Sitting with the tunes, which actually you you pick out a lot of the melodies vocally. Sometimes. And, yeah. Well, when I work with people, I don't like to be super opinionated about what I want them to do. Mm. I just like people that I like, and I just trust them. Yeah. I would never tell Alan Zemitis what to play <laughs> on the piano. He's got the Zemitis touch. He's why would the you Zemitis need to? Touch. <laughs> He's like the most to? amazing Hammond organ player. I'm not going to be like, you know what? So <laughs> I'm making a bit more Jimmy Smith. Yeah. Please. <laughs> like, so, I mean, sometimes I have. Sometimes I've cracked the whip. Well, you just contradicted yourself. Scenarios, but mostly I just like working with people that I trust in terms of, like, making the record. Has It's been the same crew of people, more or less, give or take a couple members, for yeah, three for albums? three albums. That's amazing. Sometimes yeah. chicken, dial tones, 
and this one, which is called Black Creek, right? Yeah, we could also count the 45 that I printed. Oh, yeah. Uh, one more gallon to go? Yeah. Fuck, I love that song so much. Guys, <laughs> go listen to all of Graham's records. <laughs> I've spent so much time with Graham's songs live on record, and they're both just wonderful. They're like almost two different worlds to me <laughs> because I was introduced to your music live. That well, you met me at, a sh at my show. Yeah, I said you're my best fan friend I've ever had. Really? <laughs> I like that. I went <laughs> fan first, friend second. Right? Well, you were a fan first. Uh, I like if there was like a we weren't friends. If you had like <laughs> NBA style fans, I'd be there. I'd be there in the full Graham Nicholas costume. <laughs> I'd be the, your super fan, dude. I know. Thank. Well, thank you. I I love being your super fan. I love having. Will you play another fan. song for me? Everybody, get out. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we've been. Kiss Zach. When I said we've known each other for 12 years, I meant we've dated for 12 years. <laughs> on and off. It's very emotional. All right, let's pull okay. around on this. Okay, <laughs> will, will you play another song for me, though? You want to play One Gallon to Go? Oh, sure, really? Yeah, I'll play that. Yeah, okay, I love this song. Will you talk about your van? Yeah, I'll talk about the van. Please. <laughs> That's all I have to say. This is the kind of podcast. Okay, talk about your van for a while. <laughs> uh,. It wasn't my van. Right. It was my girlfriend's van at the time. And uh, it was an uh, old Westphalia. I'm sure you all know the VW Westphalia camper van. Beautiful stick of gum cube car. Yeah. Like a little chiclet. <laughs> a little tootsie roll on wheels. <laughs> and, you know, you pop the top and sleep under the stars. It was all very romantic. Yeah. And, uh, I mean, yeah. I mean, uh, the van was part of the romance. You know, mm. I'm not going to lie. Oh, <laughs> in the first place. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no, I loved her, but the van was But it amazing. was all part of it. I mean, she had a romantic life. You know what I mean? That was all part of the, the allure. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> Sorry, it's true. I, I just heard in my head, you just wanted to get into her van. <laughs> <laughs> and she was an artist, and she... Uh, was running a zine library and zine print workshop out of the van. Out of the van. Yeah. Crazy, yeah. And uh, then what happened? Okay. And then, then the some van, travel. Then the, yeah, there was travel. But then the van broke down. And those vans are so crazy expensive. Yeah, you got to do it yourself They're to make so it work. so right. expensive yeah. to maintain and to keep alive and so, to fill up with So gas. what you're saying <laughs> is don't actually buy one. Let's don't buy them. one. They <laughs> look beautiful, but they're so expensive. Mm. And... Um, and then, you know, she was really in denial about it. it was really, she really obviously was attached to the van. For how long? How long does this denial last? It was like seven months. Seven months maybe. of denial? Okay. That's... It was like not in use and parked on the street. In Toronto? Yeah. On, a on our street. Busy side street just off of King Street somewhere. Yes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. This is... And, you know, she was like, if I don't see it, like it's... It's not a problem. <laughs> Wait, it's parked outside of the house? Yeah, it was parked on the sidewalk. <laughs> okay, that's, that's and, uh, <laughs> and eventually... Would you cover it in leaves? No, but okay. nature did. Yeah. And eventually, you know, parking is like a full contact sport in Toronto. It's not... You're, you're, we're all spoiled with 50 miles of elbow room out here, and people are like, yeah, you can park anywhere. But there, it's like, oh, you got to read the signs. <laughs> and it's, it's, it's terrible. Uh, but people on the street started, uh, like, becoming hostile towards <laughs> the van being parked there for so long. And they were leaving notes under our windshield wiper. And You're lucky they didn't tip it over. I honestly. know. I know. <laughs> yeah, like, Toronto's like that. And then we got letters from the city. And they were like, we're just going to take this away. Wow. And this was in the Doug Ford era. So I was like, like Dofo? Rob Ford. Sorry, it's been so long. Rofo. Rofo. And I was like, Rob can have it. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> but he better come get it himself. But, better, but he better come down. And lift it with one anyway. crack strength lift. And then we eventually, you know, I sat her down and we had the, the talk about selling the van. And I was like, look, I think she did really say this. I was like, look, we really, really got to sell this van. I know it's meant a lot to you over the years. She had gone on this big, beautiful cross country road trip with her son yeah. in it. And she had done all our art projects out of it. I was like, but I think it's time. And then she was like, but if we sell the van, Graham, we're going to lose that parking space. <laughs> <laughs> that parking space represents everything to me. Yeah. She was like Precious. holding, Precious. holding Precious. on to anything to keep this van. And I was like, well, that's not a good enough 
reason. Yeah. <laughs> I think we need to talk to somebody else. I think we need to talk to somebody else. <laughs> so Wait, sold. what was the van named? Uh, it was called Carl, Sa- uh, Carl Wagon, named after Carl Sagan. Beautiful. The, so the it astro- traveled the, the universe. The astrophysicist. <laughs> yeah, this van has been all over the universe. It not was just... a space van. Wow. Um, so then I wrote this song when we sold it to like make her feel better. Her legacy song. <laughs> yeah, it's maybe the nicest thing I've ever done. She broke up with me. <laughs> Actually, I don't even know if that's true. Let me think back. <laughs> this is going to be recorded. That was such a like cold ending to <laughs> such an introduction for such a sweet song. Yeah, it was sweet. I, I'm sweet. You are, you are sweet in this pot. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> My car's been broken down It's downright busted Instead of driving it round It sits idle and it gets rusted Well, my starter, it don't start And my engine, it don't eng And it's a Saturday night And I'm stuck at home again and objects in my mirror They're much further than they appear So when I see you in my rear view Well, I'll know that you're not near At 19 miles to the gallon 20 miles to your door That's just a one gallon to go Objects in my mirror, they're much further than they appear. So when I see you in my rear view, well, I'll know that you're not near. At 19 miles to the gallon, 20 miles to your door, that's just a one gallon to go and a little. Rickety wheels, they wobble and they shake like the way our love feels. There's some give, there's some take. Rickety wheels, they wobble and they shake like the way our love feels. There's some give, there's some take. Beauty, beauty, beauty. So everyone laughs at the my starter don't start and my engine don't inch, yeah. which is funny, and I like that line. I'm just going to say it. I don't care. <laughs> and but the line that I really like, which only a couple people have like ever guffawed at, is uh, well, you know, in your mirror it says objects in the mirror are closer than they appear. So, so I was like, my car's so broken. It says objects in the mirror are further than they appear. <laughs> And so only when a few I, people get that. So when I see you in the rear view, I'll know that you're not near. I love that. Line. And I was yeah. like, oh, that's funny. And like, but only sometimes 
Whenever someone laughs at that line, I'm like, oh, you're like... Do you judge audience <laughs> IQ? Like, when they laugh at that line, you're like, aha, I'm in a classy place. These people read the, uh, their side view no, mirrors, I, at least. I don't know. Maybe <laughs> These people read their side view mirrors. I mean, yeah, I've played with some dumb people. Oh, yeah. I mean, we all have. But You've been halfway because, through the gig, we're like, man, this But is, I would not <laughs> judge the intelligence of an audience based on that. No, why would you I judge would, the intelligence? I have judged the intelligence of an audience if they're drunk and... Yeah. Trying to be like, yo, can you play? Play drinking problems again. <laughs> no, they were, can you play Uptown Girl? <laughs> yes. And I'm like, this guy's an idiot. Yeah, someone actually requested <laughs> a, a Bob Seger song for me once, and I was like, have you listened to any of the set? I play my Baby least, I Got. <laughs> my least favorite is when they're like, oh, I'm pretty good at guitar. Can I play? I'm like, no, you cannot play. <laughs> I see. I want to challenge them. I I want to bring the heckler up on stage and be like, "All right, why don't no. you play everyone's song?" Uh, I have song? boundaries. <laughs> right. See, I want to embarrass them. I want them to like fall over. I remember on stage. one guy brought uh, a harmonica to a show. Okay. And he was really drunk. Was he good though? No. Oh. He's terrible. They're never good. Oh, so he's no like a hobo. No one who ever harmonica. shows up to a show and he's like, "Hey, I'm gonna play on your set." I don't know. I had a good. great harmonica player once come up, and it yeah. blew my mind. But. Well, okay. I don't know. It is that weird, weird instrument where you're like, this would go either way. This guy's going to be amazing. But I was, I was pretty ruthless with him. I remember like being pretty, What'd you pretty do? mean to him. <laughs> On stage? Yeah. I really tore into him. Did he have his own microphone? No. He was just playing in front of me. And uh, he, was with his, he was with a woman. And uh, I was like, what's going on here? I was like, are you with this thing? And this then, thing? <laughs> this harmonica? <laughs> And she was, and he was like, "That's my fiance." <laughs> he said that. Yeah. What was the look on her face? She was embarrassed. <laughs> okay. And I was like, I looked at her, and I was like, "So you're not married yet? <laughs> you still have a chance to get I was out like, of this you harmonica, can get out, girl." <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Marry an accordion player. They're way nicer. <laughs> hey, you want to hear a a joke I just heard? Yeah, of course. You're good at these. <laughs> this is really quick. Okay. How do you how do you know that a toothbrush was invented by a banjo player? How? Because if it was invented by anyone else, it'd be called a teeth brush. <laughs> I thought you would like that. That's so discriminatory towards banjo players. I I fucking hate that joke. <laughs> no, uh, no, I do think a lot of banjo players have a full set of teeth, though. Now, Graham, I think I know, that it's dates. Just a joke. That joke's Thank a little you. outdated. We sir. were just making fun of banjo players. Banjo players. <laughs> That's way better than the last joke you told me about the two cows that are owned by the same guy. Yeah, let's not go down this road. No, that, that was a, <laughs> that's a, a lame joke. I'm just going to say it. Um, but you're a good joke teller in general. You have a good, great memory for this kind of stuff, mm. which I think comes from you reading probably your entire life. Well, probably and singing. I you, memorize all these songs. Yeah. It's locked away... Like I'm, I'm you reserve places, you reserve spots in your brain, though, for that kind of material. I, feel I do. Like. Yeah. You uh, you made the joke recently to me that you were like born and raised as if you were a kid in the 1950s. Why yeah. why do you feel like that? Because <laughs> you do retain information. Now we're going to talk like about my childhood. Who this lived is, pre-internet? This is where I'm going to cry. Okay. <laughs> this is where the Oprah moment. Yeah. Oh, I'm more of a Doctor Phil. Why guy, but do okay. I feel like that? Because. No, uh, <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> no uh, measures were taken to accommodate my childhood. They were all, I was just raised <laughs> like a young adult. <laughs> right. Like your parents were like, come along. And yeah. you were like a baby crawling. And they were like, now get dressed. Like, we, there was no kid things. Like no, like, loud cartoons or like. Yeah. Toys or I had toys. I had Lego. You still I wasn't I wasn't tunes. deprived. Yeah, I wasn't deprived. Yeah, you were still watching but this stuff on Like here. my parents weren't like child people. They were Ooh. great parents, but they weren't I like, let's go you. to Disneyland because kids love that. Yeah, yeah. They were like, We're gonna read all day. You go do whatever you want. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> and like this is a good one. Like they bought a Nintendo once for Vanessa, my sister and I, and they just gave us Virtual chess. <laughs> I didn't even know that existed on Nintendo. <laughs> yeah. So that was my childhood. Okay. So I, I read chess. a lot. No friends came over to my house. Yeah. You know, I wasn't. My house wasn't the fun kid house. Yeah, I know what you mean. We watched old movies. 
old TV shows. So like that's why like I know all this like <laughs> I yeah. listen to old music. My dad only listens to jazz. <laughs> we played we played this like board game, quote unquote, the other night that was cards and it was identify who you can. It was called Who's This, basically. But all the cards, this whole game took place pre nineteen eighty five, maybe I wanna say. So all the cards were nineteen fifties movie stars 1930s. into the sixty thirties movie stars. <laughs> And Fran and I are like sucking at this game. We're we're not doing too well. We're doing okay. But Graham on the score sheet has three columns worth of points. He's dominating <laughs> and he's naming like, oh, Bridget Bardot's first husband, or the czar of the Duke of Ferdinand's cousin. Like it was I don't know, not, not yeah. those ones, but they were it was crazy. So yeah, you had this wild back knowledge. When I was like a, a kid for Christmas, I was like eleven. I think my dad gave me all these tapes of the Dick Cavett show. Amazing. <laughs> Which is this old yep. current events talk show from the 60s. Great host, by the way. I would love to be as good as Dick Yeah, Cavett. so it's just weird. I was like watching. <laughs> I don't know why. That's your pop culture. That was my pop culture. Years is like prior. 60s and 50s pop culture. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, wow, I got to see these <laughs> Everly brothers live. Yeah, Those like, young kids look hot. Oh, this debate between uh, Gore Vidal and William F. Buckley is quite contentious. <laughs> at 11. <laughs> at 11. So, yeah, by 15, you're like reading Christopher Hitchens and being like, well, I don't know, Christopher. Uh, yeah. We'll see about that. Yeah, I wasn't. Yeah. Yeah. You're, yeah. <laughs> I think Graham is the most well read person I know. So that I'm fascinated. I think it is. <laughs> I think you read at a faster rate and you've read more in your life. No, I have a hot tip if anyone will. wants to be a good reader. I'm not a fast reader. Have somebody else do it for you? No, the okay. tip is you bring your book everywhere. Just so it looks like you read? No. So they, you, you take, got me fooled. You, you read every chance you get. Yeah. People think I'm a fast reader, but I'm not. I'm pretty slow. Right. So the, the trick is you bring your book everywhere. It also helps that your cell phone screen is smashed all the time. Because <laughs> <laughs> most people are just like staring at their phones. And you're like, well... People think that when you right. read, you should like draw a bath and pour a glass of wine and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. And like, no, you just got to like read in line. You got to read on the public transit. You got to mm -hmm. read at your work break. Again, there's no public transit out here. I so know. That's unfortunate. <laughs> but, um, you got to read standing at the cold bus stop. I was talking to Corin Raymond... Fantastic songwriter. Yes, he's a fantastic songwriter. What's he's your favorite Korn song, actually? <laughs> uh, too many to name. I'm sorry to put you on we'll the spot. We'll but. put a pin in that. Okay. Anyway, I love Korn, Raymond's songs. I don't know him that well, but he's quite friendly, and he's such a tall tale teller. Oh, yeah, he played Deep Roots out here a couple of years amazing. ago. It was amazing. But he is a better retainer of, like, poetry. Like, he can, like, quote poems and stuff on command. Hmm. And he told me that he would go swimming. Like he would do laps at the public pool and he would try and memorize a poem while he was doing laps. And I was like, oh, that's cool. That's a good tip. What happens if you forget a line while you're doing the laps? I don't know, maybe he's got the, the book on the shore. <laughs> and like a waterproof, <laughs> he's got a laminated yeah, piece of paper underwater. And he would just like <laughs> meditate. Oh my God, I just burped on. That's fine. We he ate would, apples on air like he four would, or two episodes. Like ago. meditate going back and forth in the flow of the water, like reciting these poems to himself. Wow. Yeah. He's a much better reader than I am. I Do think. you have sort of a meditation ritual at all? No. Not even around music? Like you don't really have a pre warm up. I did see Graham step outside and scream as loud as he could for four <laughs> minutes that straight. Didn't <laughs> no, that didn't happen. No, that didn't happen. But that's my warm up. But yo, do you have one? Oh, meditation? Or just or sort of like Korn a pre-show. Uh, you said put a pin in the corn thing, so I wasn't going <laughs> to push you into going back to that. I don't have but. a pre-show thing. Okay. No. Nothing. Um, but a favorite corn song? Yeah, please. Let's get back to that. Well, I'm just going to say this one. I can't remember what it's called. Uh, but the first line of it is, this is like a crazy good line. And I would listen to it. I listen to it a lot this winter, and it was just like, yeah, I cried all the time. <laughs> Every time I listen to this song. Really? It's so good. And the opening line is, uh, the, the March sky is a dead pigeon gray. Oh. Wait, it's not done. <laughs> and it's heavy like a tab you can't pay. <sighs> and you just w know it's going to be one of those days when you wish that your mother wasn't so far away. Oh, Corin. <laughs> 
I get goosebumps now. <laughs> yeah, I can see it. I can see it. Yeah, see, we have cried together. Even I love that song. That's wild. Yeah, yeah, he's such a good writer. So it's sometimes the bar, sometimes you lower the bar, and sometimes the bar lowers you. That's his. That's his song. That's his. No, he didn't write that. Yeah, line. that must have come a hundred years no, he before. Wrote that. Sorry, Corin, to doubt you. I know you're a great he writer. He wrote but that. That's it's a great song. That's trademarked by like Jerry Lewis or something <clears throat> before. What does he say? He says. Um, <laughs> Uh, the rainwater falls sideways like back alley piss. What's a girl like you doing in a song like this? <laughs> oh my God! Corin said that. Yeah, <laughs> oh, that's it's a amazing. Great line. The lines, uh, my favorite songs are like Fort Mac or. Uh, he didn't write that. I wondered if he did. Yeah, he. he that he, whole album is covers. That is. Yeah. Okay, I thought that was like a fake Doug Norquist or something. He, no, that's he Rob Varmeyer. Okay, he's from. Uh, Manitoba. That, that song is crazy good. Great song. But Hard on Things then is my favorite corner song. That. That's a yeah. crazy good song because I'm very hard on things. So that song moves he me. He wrote that I think with Jonathan Bird from oh, North that makes sense. Carolina. Yeah. Uh, actually, on the topic of like songwriters like this, okay, so we just mentioned Jonathan Burr. We mentioned Corn Raymond. There's so many songs that were, were so many songwriters that we're mentioning right now. And I'm gonna throw uh, Mike Kerr's name in the mix because throw it in there. I we love, love Mike, Mike Kerr. Kerr so much, and he's an incredible player and plays with Corin. Yeah. But who are the early songwriters other than Dell that mm -hmm. you were starting to craft your songs and get? And start to write your material and and mock. I well, asked you John once. Prine. Of course, still. John Prine. Yeah, you can clap for that. Clap for John Prine. The rest is yeah. beautiful soul. John Prine was like a huge influence when I was younger, and like still, still, but I'm yeah. trying not to be such a copycat. Oh, but you but, do those. You cover him so beautifully that it's not a copycat. It is a real beautiful day. I remember when I would like go out and see shows and then people would play a song and I remember seeing someone play Spanish Pipe Dream for the first time and I was like, oh, wow, what song is that? And they're like, oh, yeah. that was a John Prine song and then hmm. I saw someone play um, Dear Abby Oh, and they were like, great. that was a John Prine song and I was like, okay, well, by the th third time I heard someone say that, I was like, oh, I gotta figure this you out. You gotta hammer it into your skull. So I like went out and bought all his albums and he's the best. John Prine's the best because <laughs> uh, his lines are funny and sad. Yeah, just like Horns. In just a way. like, yeah. <laughs> like a good. It's uh, it's like a whole emotional roller coaster in a line. And then, uh, let alone four minutes of so it, where funny. he so just goes funny so and so sad. Place. Yeah, so cool. and storyteller, but like wordsmith in the way that so they're still jokes. so relatable. So, yeah. okay, like. I kind of think this is a bit, you could kind of maybe hear this in like One Gallon to Go, the song I just played. Mm -hmm. I remember him talking about, he was like, oh, you know what I really find, he's like, I just find people funny. They were like asking him like, why do you write, like how do you write songs like this? He's like, I don't know, I'm just, I just like people's foibles. And he was like, I just like it when someone parks too far away from the curb and then they get mad when someone scratches their car. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, that's, that's great. It's just like the yeah. tiniest details that he thinks are dramatic, like tiny and like a mundane yeah. details of someone's life are high drama in a John Prine song. Didn't that become Americana in general? It's like always like those little moments well, that you got to hold on I, to. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. No, no, up. no. No, he's better than that. Yeah, because he's po <laughs> he's poetic. No, I'm just yeah. teasing. It. But yeah, it's. It's beautiful poetry. John John Prine is perfect for that, but you also like And there's nothing there's nothing highfalutin about it at all. There's nothing simple uh, language. It's not like a bo like I love Bob Dylan a lot, but there's nothing like phew, there's nothing like a Bob Dylan lyric in uh in John <laughs> There's Prine no pomp and circumstance and it's like I'm not gonna yeah. I because I love Bob Dylan, so yeah, I'm not no, gonna I'm I'm, this is not but he's a totally different songwriter. Yeah, yeah. You also you dig records out of the dollar bin that I've never even heard of these songwriters and you're like, Wow, it's amazing to find this. Like Yeah. Well that's like, what I that's what I all I think about. <laughs> I know. It's amazing. Like Jesse Winchester was one of those names. Yeah, I love Jesse Winchester. There was another one, uh David Essig. Yep. That you pulled out, I remember once. That wasn't out of a dollar bin. That was a great find. But didn't you open for him at one point, too? No, I did not open for okay. David. I've met him a bunch. Okay. And I got into his music because someone was throwing out his records on their lawn. And I was like, well, I'll just grab that. Like, that looks cool. 
Was uh, it, there's a couple fighting, and you're like, oh, don't mind if I do. <laughs> yeah, sorry, sir. So I took it, and I listened to it, and it was Redbird County, if anyone is interested in finding this David Essig record. It's and a great it's record. so good. I was like, oh, my God, like, I loved it. And when I met him, I told him that story, and all he could focus on was, like, who's throwing out my records? <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> yeah. But I didn't, I didn't get to open for him. I've met him a bunch, but I was going to go play out West the summer that COVID struck. Mm -hmm. And I emailed him because he lives on one of the tiny islands off the coast of Nanaimo. Okay. Off the main, off to Vancouver Island. Yeah. He lives on a smaller island. I don't know what it's called. But Galliano or something? I, I don't know. But I was like, hey, man, like, I'm going to be in Nanaimo playing a show. Like, do you want to do something? And he said no because he was playing this big theater show like a couple days later. And he's like, I can't yeah. do this thing. And he's like, but... I'll learn all your songs. He was like, send me your records. And like him and his agent and his manager were like, oh, yeah, like we really like your records. And wow. Like, yeah. And that never got to happen because COVID came. Yeah. But I was like, holy crap, like David Essig wants to play my songs. Too bad. Who produced Willie P. Bennett, should be said. Wow. I did <laughs> not know that. The Willie P., who so you're also like, a huge yeah, fan a of. Cat. And I just like everything that David's done. He's a producer. He opened, uh, he started uh, Woodshed Records, which is a okay. record label in the 70s. He's American originally, but he, I don't know if he's a draft dodger. I'm not going to say that. But he did come up in the 70s. And uh, yeah, he started this record label and made so many good albums. He made albums um, for Willie P. Bennett. He played on Fred Eaglesmith early records. Great, wow. He um, recorded uh, the Humber Valley River band or whatever, yeah, that bluegrass yeah. band that's super good. Cool. Uh, super Canadian of, the records. He did a lot of this work crazy. with, um, who's that guy that produces like U2 and everything? Where's Ryan? Uh, Daniel Lanois? Yes, Daniel Lanois. He wow. did. <laughs> he made Where's records. Ryan? I love that you're like, where's Ryan Stanley? I need some I information. Ryan Stanley I don't trust this. this guy next to me, even though <laughs> I was right. <laughs> about ELO, okay? If you listen to episode two, That's I was true. right that Witchy Woman <laughs> is an Eagles song. It's not by ELO. I get the Seinfeld reference came true, okay? Yeah. Anyway, don't You're look right. to Ryan. Look I'm to me. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Zach. I know. Enough. I know. So he yeah. produced records Daniel with, Lanois, with the Lanois brothers. Whoa, there's a brother. I didn't know yeah. that. Cool. And uh, one, <laughs> after I just boasted about knowing everything. One <laughs> thing that I did like about one thing, I, one of the many things I liked about David's show is after he plays, he gets down to the audience and he shakes everyone's hand. Everybody? Yeah. And I was like, whoa, that's classy. Oh my God. And I tried that and I was like, this, wow. takes, this could take some time or it's Holy awkward. Smokes, it's like a presidential candidate. But he it's just like, goes around and he's like, thank you so much for coming. And you're like, wow, it's so classy. And he's been doing it for like, 60 years. You should just do the runoff stage high five move <laughs> where the whole room puts That's their like hands BA up. That's Johnston. <laughs> oh, right. Well, at that point, you have to get like half naked you have to get half and like naked. jump into the crowd a little bit, give them a taste of your body, and then <laughs> no, God is, love him. David is a big it? influence, and he's a very. Gener like that's a very generous thing to do, I think, if you're a performer and you finish and you go around and shake everybody's hand. Yeah. We're not doing that tonight, by the way. Not doing Every, that. For everyone here, <laughs> I know you want to shake our hands. He's I know a, you're waiting there. He's a wonderful uh, influence. I, I wonder if he's there. still sitting there learning your songs. If I he's got know. all That'd your songs nice. worked out and he's like, I wonder when that Graham boy's going to call <laughs> me back. Just <laughs> sitting in his so. basement waiting by the phone, playing your songs perfectly. <laughs> David Essig wants you, dude. You got to get out there. You know, oh, I wanted to say this actually because this is a public forum. Your podcast. <laughs> now that you're now that you have a public forum, go ahead so, and announce your candidacy. Speaking of other people playing my songs, yeah. So I started off with Mountain Flower. Yeah, I think that would be a really good bluegrass song, and I really want a bluegrass band to cover it. What now? <laughs> well, so I'm hoping like I the slow can. Need... I'm hoping the slow can ramblers will listen yeah, to this. Yeah. Okay. You're or that maybe Frank? Mike Kerr will listen to this. I'd be like, hey, man, the, the slow cane ramble should hear this. I'm hoping everyone <laughs> hears this and goes, wow, Graham's songs are amazing. Everybody should be covering these songs. Right? I, just want, I just want them to cover Mountain Flower. Well, then they need to know what mountain is it about. What? What mountain is it about? What mountain is it about? Well, I guess the Rocky Mountain. I wrote it in um, Montana. Whoa. Yeah. Montana mountains? Yeah. I was driving out west. And then I dipped, I was in Alberta, and then I dipped into the States, 
This is actually kind of a weird story about when I wrote it. <laughs> uh oh. I was staying at a KOA. Were you smuggling drugs or something? Or? No, I wasn't. Okay. okay. I was staying at a KOA, a Camp of uh, Americas. I don't know if you know those. And Why do they have to spell it with a K? I don't know. It's mm. America. <laughs> Classic. Big mistake in America. And I was sitting around the fire and I was just playing. And then I have this philosophy that, like, it, it's not really a philosophy, it's more of like a dumb rule that gets me into trouble. Yeah. But well, you have someone, a degree, so if, it makes sense. If anyone like offers you a drink or like extends some sort of uh, hospitality, mm -hmm. you should just say yes every time. That's a Greek philosophy. Thank you, but it's gotten me into trouble. And this yeah. was one time. Okay. So I, was playing, I was playing my guitar by fire, and the guy next door at the campsite was like, hey, man, like, um, make it some rum and Cokes. You want to come hang out? And I was like, sure. So I went over. And he was terrifying. <laughs> uh oh. He was like, he showed. He ended up showing me this video on his phone about of him having an armed standoff with the cops. And I was like, why are you not in jail? For uh, whose perspective is it shot from? From his house. He was like in his house with a gun, being like, whoa, whoa, whoa. okay, yeah, it was weird. And, and you're at a KOA yeah. with this man in the dark. <laughs> yes. Okay. So I finished my drink and got out of there, and that's when I wrote Mountain Flower in one sitting. I don't know why, oh. like, I was like, oh, I'm going to write this song. What now. a terrifying experience. I'll write the most beautiful song I've written in 10 years. I don't know why that <laughs> Sometimes they just come out of nowhere like that. What, did he say anything? Was he like, you know, sometimes you find a mountain flower? <laughs> no, there was no... My wife is like a mountain rose, Graham. Hey, take a look at this gun I found. <laughs> no, no, no. No? Okay. <laughs> it was weird. Wow. So, at Southern Mountains, you traveled a ton, too, eh? That, that song yeah, came I've, out of a lot of travel then. I've toured a lot, yeah. I love that you you were so scared that you wrote a song to comfort yourself. Well, there's not. Yeah, I just think it's funny because there's nothing about that experience or that night in that song. That was your brain going like, just cover get it out of here. Just cover yeah. it up. Just, you know, a duvet blanket on the brain. Mm, yeah, yeah. Mountain flower, mountain That's flower. What it was. Mm. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, I feel like a great expression that you've turned into a song that to me is very soothing is sometimes chicken, sometimes feathers. Yeah. Sometimes you get chicken, and sometimes you get feathers. When you recorded this song, uh, it meant a lot to me. The whole album actually did that Graham recorded. It's called Sometimes You Get Chicken, Sometimes You Get Now, this is one I would say is a bit of, seems kind of pretty John Priney to me. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, it's, it really leans into it on the record. It's cool. So, yeah, this is an old song. This is, oh, this is uh, almost 10 years this yeah. record came out. But... So this is like an example of when I was like, oh, maybe I should listen to other things other than John Prime. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, I picked this expression up from Del Barber oh, okay. as well, because he was like, oh, we were driving in the car, and he was like, oh, my dad always says this. And I was just like, yoink, like, how are you not going to write a song about that? <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah, your career is stealing people. Keith well, Richards, mm, look, Del all Barber. All my mm. best, I say, I would say all the best songs are not things that like I make up. No. They're things I hear. They're throwaways for other people. Other yeah. people just say these amazing things and throw yeah. them on the ground, and I just walk behind them and pick it up. I love that you're touring with Del Barber at this point. So full circle, but here is, you are, yeah. being inspired by I wasn't by Del touring Barber. with him. I just did one show. Oh, then traveling in the car with Del yeah. to a, on the way to a show, and you're kind of probably like, oh, hey, wow, this is cool. Yeah, it was cool. It's That's great. awesome. It's great. Uh, he's been very supportive of me. That, uh, and it shows. So yeah. he says, sometimes you get chickens, sometimes you get feathers. Uh, but, you know, real, real writing advice, writing is just as much about listening as it is about being creative. Mm -hmm. You have to, like, be open to people. and like, Let it come yeah. to you? That's right. Anyway, so he said this, and I was like, well, that's funny. And I went home, and I wrote it immediately. And then I sent it to him. So he, <laughs> he threatened your life, and you went home and wrote a song no, again to comfort yourself? I meant Del. <laughs> Del. Right, right. Not the weird armed mountain man that I narrowly escaped from. Well, sometimes you get chicken, sometimes you get feathers. And sometimes good times, they ought to be a lot better. But that ain't what you got. That ain't the hand you've been dealt 
And that heartache you're feeling, that's love you once felt. Well, Benny's got a band, and don't you know, he plays Friday nights down at the water and hole. Well, that must be where my money does go and my bills, they come well, I ain't got no bills. Sing a song for you and a song for me. He plays songs for money, but he writes them for free. We go out each week and we dance some too because Benny, he's got songs that leaves you blues. Sometimes you get shaken, sometimes you get feathered. Sometimes good times, they ought to be a lot better. That ain't what you got, that ain't the hand you've been dealt. And that shame that you're feeling, that's pride you once felt. You make me starry-eyed, like a night in July, make me weak. My knees, you give birds to my bees. But honey ain't cheap, and money ain't time. And that heart you've been stealing, will I think it's been mine? So leave the porch light on. Won't you unlock that door? Cause I know you didn't mean all them mean things before. Cause true love takes a lot, but with me it takes more. All this fussing and this fighting, what good is it for? Can't you hear those words coming up from the hall? Sometimes sweet nothings ain't whispered at all. Can't you hear my heart beating way across the room? It's been ticking and it's talking all night just to you. Sometimes you get chicken, sometimes you get feathers. And sometimes good times, they ought to be a lot better. But that ain't what you got. And you've been dealt And that heartache you're feeling That's love you once felt okay. I remember when that came out And you only ever remember the bad reviews <laughs> Oh no Yeah, and I got a bad review for, what? The, for that record And he hated this song what? specifically What magazine? I don't please, remember. please tell me so I, I can write them a bad review. But he was like, I just remember him being like, and the lyrics really suck. And he was like, <laughs> wait, wait, wait. <laughs> Toronto, obviously. Was no, it, it was to not. You? It was okay. not Toronto. Oh, wow. But then he like quoted this line, and it was totally like a misquote. And I was like, well, no wonder. Like, you hate the writing. That's your writing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I uh, didn't write unplug that. Unplug your ears, sir. <laughs> You should have written an op-ed. Like, yeah, like, oh, perhaps the wax in your ear has congealed, sir. <laughs> I was like, I didn't write that shit. You did. Wow. Oh, I was pissed. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. I love that song. That's such a good song. Oh, man. thank you. It's brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, that whole album actually meant a lot to me. Like, <laughs> um, There's Penny on that, song, on that album, too, right? That's the album that you redid it on, which mm -hmm. I love that song. That was the song that first hooked me for Graham, if anyone's curious. Uh, Penny did it for me, uh, and then on this new album you have like a couple songs that really, it that hit me that I've never heard you play, okay. like uh like every dog brings its own fleas. I was like, wow, yeah, that's, that's great. <laughs> well, that's true. Every dog. Well, I just mean like I haven't written that in a while. That's or awesome. Uh, yeah, you don't really live. play it that often no. live, eh? No, it's not really. Great, great tune. There's a there's a bunch of new songs on Graham's. <laughs> new album that you should definitely listen to. His single, Julie Truly, is out right now, which yep. I'm going to do something that doesn't, pod, that doesn't 
<laughs> yeah, it, it doesn't, doesn't translate work. on a podcast, but I am a truly, 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 I'm truly <laughs> a fan of these t-shirts that Graham has printed, which if you're listening on this podcast, go into the interweb right now, open your Chrome browser, and what you're going to want to do is type in Graham Nicholas Julie Truly t-shirt. This is for the folks at home. Yeah, this is for the, yeah. Or you guys live, you guys can just close your eyes and picture your phones and your hands. I was worried about making those shirts. No, it's great. Because it's kind of an obscure music. Re- I mean, you look great. but I'm, I'm thrusting my chest for those who can't see on the podcast. It is like an I'm obscure like music reference because I based it off of an old Beach Boys t-shirt. But I was like, maybe it doesn't really, people don't need to get it to think it's a cool shirt. I was like, I think it looks cool. No, yeah, yeah, you just like you were like, hey Brian, great idea, dude. Thanks, Brian Wilson. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, when he comes to Halifax next, you should go up to him and He's be like, alive. look, dude, <laughs> dude, look what I made. You want one? <laughs> you should give Brian Wilson a Julie Truly shirt. <laughs> Brian, right, well, when you time. listen to this podcast, this is a Brian, public forum. We're gonna yeah. try and get in touch with the Slow Can Ramblers to try and cover Mountain Flower. Yeah, and we're gonna try and get in touch with Brian Wilson. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if Frank <laughs> Evans Julie, doesn't truly, listen to this sure. podcast, I'll be kind of bothered. But if Brian Wilson doesn't listen to this podcast, I'll be really bothered. Like, Brian, we go way back, man. <laughs> we go. Why wouldn't you check out the Friendly Heckler? Um, I'm going to... I just want to... I'm blown away that you were willing to do this. I think it's so weird that we've known each other for so long and you were willing to do this. Why would I not? I don't know, because we have a history of yelling at each other. We don't and yell at each other that much. <laughs> One, yeah, somebody wants us to yell at each other. No, it was only once, and you know whose fault it is? I blame Dylan Jewers of Big Turnips Records. <laughs> he didn't Dylan say brought anything. it out of me. That guy <laughs> incites the fire. He's, he's probably going to listen to this. So, and No, Dylan, I, you incite the fire in my heart. Sir. I don't think he did anything. No, I think he didn't. It was you. No. <laughs> I, I'm a contrarian, and, and you true. call me out on it, which I appreciate. Yeah. Like when you posted a, a photo of podcasting, I'd rather be broadcasting. <laughs> That's absolutely true. It was a t shirt that Graham saw, and he was like, I don't want to do your podcast, dude. I want to go <laughs> fishing. I didn't take it personally. No, thank you. It's a I good mean, idea. You're welcome. <laughs> I don't know what I'm supposed to say. <laughs> you're, not supposed, you're just supposed to be you. But I appreciate you heckling the friendly heckler. Yeah, anytime, man. You're doing it. You keep me humble, I'll keep you humble. Really? For how much longer? <laughs> I don't know. It's your call. Until we get really famous, and then we're just going to be like, dude, it's never buy me happen. a car. It's never going to happen. Why not? It's just not. Why? Because we're And it doesn't matter. That's true. <laughs> well, I was my... having a conversation with, well, this is, uh, we were t- I was talking to Dylan. <laughs> that that guy fires me up. And Come we on. were just... We were talking about. <laughs> we were like, man, we should do a we should do a washboard Hank tribute album. And then I was like, ah, but no one would buy it. <laughs> Why? And well, and I was like, because not a lot of people know who washboard Hank is. Yeah. And then I was like, that's all I want is like thirty years from now, two like music nerds are like, man, we should do a Graham Nicholas tribute album. And the other one goes, yeah, but no one would buy it. That's how <laughs> I feel. Yeah, that's your <laughs> idea of fame. Well, all the people that I really like look up to, they're just around. They're not famous. They're yeah. not they're still alive. Or the people that I like think that I'm gonna wind up in like the people that I emulate or the it's people that I like Absolutely. That's why I brought up the record bin thing. Because you find albums that in record bins, and I'm like, I've never heard of that person. And you're like, he's still alive. He lives in Peterborough. I know. And I'm like, that's I, crazy. I <laughs> have gone, I have gone on, um, like, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, uh, tirades. Like, no, like a religious voyage. Meccas. It was kind of like a mecca, but there's another word for it. Uh. Anyway. A crusade, a crusade, maybe. A crucible. It's oh, a crucible. Well. We can cut this out, right? Nope. It's not a crucible, by no. the way. <laughs> but I have. You've like, crucified somebody for I the sake of music. I have gone to go a pilgrimage. Okay. That's the exact. That the was word. the one you wanted. Yeah. Okay. I have gone yeah. on like pilgrimages to go meet people, like yeah. songwriters that I really like that are still alive. That I, are still alive. I envy you because all of my heroes are dead. <laughs> all of my musical heroes are dead. So I envy you for looking up to those who are still alive. Yeah. Uh, you, like and there's one that I haven't done yet that I'd really I'd li- really like to go meet David Whiffen. Who's, hey, David, who lives in the uh, Ottawa Valley. 
Oh, that's not that far. You could it's do not, that. Yeah. Where in the Ottawa Valley? Do you know? I don't know. I Somewhere? haven't completed my research. Ooh, I hope he's in Chelsea. David, if you're near Chelsea, I'll find you, bud. But I'm a huge fan of David Whiffen. But when I was in Winnipeg, Please, I looked up Jeffrey Hatcher, who's like my favorite. Hmm. He's from this band called the Blue Shadows that no one remembers anymore. Right. We've talked about it. At that's least okay. no one east of Winnipeg. People like west of Winnipeg love that band. But no one out here rem- like knows that band. And I was like in Winnipeg and I like found him <laughs> through friends of friends. And then uh, like <laughs> he was really creeped out. I don't know if he was, but he bought me breakfast. That's nice. He took me out for breakfast, and I was like, man, like, oh, I love your one record you put out in 1992. And he's like, okay. <laughs> he was kind of weirded out, but we ended up having a good time. That's better at breakfast than at 2 a.m. after the gig. But so. I, I, yeah, I, 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 I'm just like obsessed with these, like, just this, like, very understated class of these, like, Canadian songwriters that... Mm-hmm just wrote killers they just killed it in obscurity you know yeah 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 i love those you're things. a student of the underdog in a <laughs> yeah, way guess, yeah. yeah yeah i think you will make it though because no, you got the heart too <laughs> i think well your idea of making I it i think wherever i am like now it, is where i'm gonna get well those <laughs> no no that's not how it works i'm sorry you don't just <laughs> plateau for the rest of your life dude no if you want those two kids to find your record and be like we should start a cover band a graham nicholas cover band and then do a cover album then you're gonna make it. That's if that's all you're asking. Yeah, but then for, the other one has to go. Yeah, but no one will get it. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> then you're still making it. Uh, yeah, I guess. Yeah, you just have to change. That's part of the secret of success. If you ha- you have to keep defi- redefining your idea of success. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And that's not a joke. No. I think that's true. I think that's beautiful. I think that's evolution. I think. Yeah, it's- and you just have to not quit. That's the other secret. You don't quit. And that's also not a joke, because you want to quit all the time. I do. I want to quit all the time. Do you want to quit right now? Sometimes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Maybe like five right minutes now. ago. <laughs> when but you started talking last time, yeah. I, I was talking, definitely. I guess I was talking to Ryan about this after his episode, and we were like, you know, sometimes people say, what's the secret to longevity? And he was like, well, the longevity is the secret. You just have to keep doing it, and then you won't stop doing it. Again, it was very I'm, zen. I'm bad at math, but I don't think any of that makes sense. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's true. I think the secret to longevity is changing how you define time. Okay, well that didn't make sense. Well, <laughs> I just I just read this like, oh, this hell planet that exists really close to a sun in another universe, and a year only lasts 17 hours on Dylan this planet. Dylan does fire you up. <laughs> Dylan, don't get me started on Dylan dangerous. right now. But 17 hours is a year on this planet. That doesn't make any sense because what's a year to them? <laughs> There's nobody on that planet. A His year shirt's a, off. A man all bets are off. Stag. Should I play a I song, will, Zach? I will pull up my belly. Look at my belly hair. <laughs> I will show you all. <laughs> Should I play a song? Please. Uh, actually, yeah. Do you want to... <laughs> Should what? we just end the episode? I guess so. <laughs> we should call this an evening. I now that I've showed you all my belly yeah, hair. Yeah, he's and, really and bared my soul. He's the you. one who's really bared his soul. I've okay. just been sitting here to get a front row seat. I showed you my bare soul. That's that's for sure. Well, I mean, if everybody wants to see it, I guess. Yeah, oh, <laughs> that's a first. That's a friendly heckler first. No belly has ever been shown on this podcast. So we'll get a photo I'm of a it. people pleaser. I'm, I'm going to need a... If anyone got a close-up, I'll, I'll post that on the Instagram. Uh, I, I, thank you. Thank, you. No, thank I, you. I love this guy. We've known each other too long. This was almost too I hope, informal. I hope this was entertaining. Me too. Uh, did you guys have a good time? Okay, good. <laughs> you listeners out there, thank you for, for listening. At the very least... If it was boring, I think I hope that something from it was useful. I hope I hope if everybody who listens who to it is... looks up all the songwriters you mentioned right. and look and starts to read. Well, I should, <laughs> should have mentioned more, but well, we could. <laughs> and like I said, if if any of it was boring, I hope if someone who's a writer got some nugget of the, none of it was boring, man. Your songs are so <laughs> beautiful. Your songs are lovely, and you're just such a great live talent. That it's it was really nice to sit up here oh, with thank, you for once you. rather than be over there, because yeah, I just think you're a great writer and a great picker. I'm not. Yeah, you are. That's you not true. you play again like the John Prine stuff and like you do that finger picking like nobody I know. You actually nail it. You're okay. Honest. 
I'm just going to be good at accepting your compliments. Yeah, okay. if you can accept a drink, <laughs> accept a compliment, yeah, you I asshole. Yeah, I guess truth there, too. Thank Except you. for the asshole thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, what do you want to finish with tonight? Uh, what do you want to cast your rod to? <laughs> that was... Is that a dirty joke? No. Cast your rod? I don't no. think so. Graham's a great fisherman, so that's a, that's a fishing pun. I know that you'd rather be rod casting than pod casting, so what are you going to okay. cast the rod out to? All right. All right. What are you going to reel in for him? Uh, I'm just looking. Uh, maybe I'll do... Um, Something for the new record, or...? Yeah, I could Ooh. do that. I could do... Uh, do you want um, Dish in the Spoon? <sighs> Great story song, or... That is a good story or song. Or what's my other option? Or Getting By With Less. Oh, shit, Graham. <laughs> Those are great. Oh, man. <laughs> Those are two great songs. This podcast is really physical. Uh, Zach is Those are two really great songs. It. Oh, man. I don't know. This is... Okay, Get By With Less. Or... Oh, man. I love Get By With Less. I was listening to it today, and I, I was like, I could get by with less. Why don't we just... What do you want? Do you want that one? I it's want you to decide because I already heckled you, although you heckled one of them for me. Well, okay, I'll do Dish in the Spoon. Okay, it is a great story song. This is a great example of how. This you is can a good pull. story song. This and is a great can... example of how you can pull literary shit together. Okay, and create literary. Pull. It's Mother Goose. Okay, it's not. It's not. I read. <laughs> <laughs> At a, until a certain age. <laughs> Don't no, call me Ishmael. Um, it's not Moby Dick. You can tell that this is an early one. Just a little writer's insight here, because I the bridge is at the end. I used to do that when I was writing. I didn't really know how bridges worked, so I thought of them as like morals to the story that I would put at the end of the song. <laughs> I found it really hard to put a bridge in the middle. Okay. When I was younger. Right. And so this song is on the new album, but I've had it for a really long time. There you go. Fun yeah. facts. Ladies and gentlemen, <laughs> let's give one more hand for our guest, Graham Nicholas, tonight. <laughs> Play him out. Buy his new record. When does your record come out, by the way? February 4th. February 4th. And we're having a release party here at Union Street oh. on Friday, April 21st. Whoa, you heard it here first. <laughs> Check it out. It's called Black Creek. It's amazing. Ladies and gentlemen, Graham Nicholas. Well, did you hear about that dish that ran away with the spoon? They ran right off and got married, shotgun honeymoon. They got a white picket fence, a big swimming pool. And three beautiful children in all the best schools. But then the spoon, he got hungry when looking for a bite. Uh-oh. He found a bowl full of loving on a Saturday night. Oh no. He left his wife and his kids back home all alone. And now the dish and the spoon, they don't talk anymore. And I hate diddle diddle with that old nursery rhyme. Human hearts can be fickle most all of the time. Did you hear about that cow that jumped over the moon? She looks down from the stars just to watch the world turn. She's got a nice patch for grazing on the astral plane. She sits on the banks of that old Milky Way. Oh, in Cassiopeia, she sits up on her throne. 
with only the stars to gaze upon while the big dipper's cup head overflows with water that falls like rain down below and a hey diddle diddle went that old nursery rhyme Hearts can be fickle most all of the time And the cat sang her songs on the bow fiddle Old love songs for lost time And the days wore on little by little Well, good love's the love that's worth more than one try. Yeah, good love's the love worth more than one try. Thank you. Keep it going for Graham Nicholas. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Now you, too, can see why I love Graham Nicholas so much. Uh, I, I want to give you his upcoming dates. He's got February 18th. He's in Toronto at the Dakota Tavern. February 24th, he's in Peterborough at Jethro's. February 25th, Green Bank at the Green Bank Folk Club. March 3rd, he's in Smith's Falls at Bowie's. March 4th, he's back in Toronto at the Cameron House. March 10th, we've got Guelph at the Cornerstone. March 11th, Melbourne, Arrowwood Farms. Um, March 18th, he's in Ottawa at Irene's. March 23rd, Wolf Island, Wolf Island Hotel. March 24th, Belleville at Capers. March 25th, Picton Acoustic Grill. My God, this man is busy. March 31st, Moth Lane Brewery, PEI. Uh, Mar April 1st, he's in PEI again at Mont in Montague at Copper Bottom Brewing. Uh, April 6th, he's in St. John at Five and Dime. Uh, April 7th, we got him in Fredericton at Grimross. April 14th at Annie Ganish. In Annie Ganish at the Red Sky Gallery. Beautiful place. Uh, April 15th, he's in Bridgetown at the Don Omen Art Gallery. Uh, April 20th, he's in Halifax at Beerleys. That's right, classic. Uh, and, oh, April 21st, as he mentioned, he's back in Burke at the Union Street, back on stage. I will not be joining him this time, so you get to see Graham Nicholas really do his thing. Uh, that's He says that's all he has so far, and that's an insane list of gigs. So definitely check him out on this great album release tour. Um, and as for us, you can check out, here's a list of our upcoming gigs. You can check it more out online, uh, on Instagram, on Facebook, on all that stuff. Just look up The Friendly Heckler, you'll find me. But I'm gonna give you the exclusive details here right now. In January, we have Tara Spencer. In February, we have Kim Joy Lake. In March, we have Sunny Chances. In April, we have Sam Wilson. In May, we're being joined by Aquaculture. That's right, folks. Those are the upcoming dates so far. Uh, more to announce, obviously, as we go along. But please keep listening. Keep joining us. Thank you so much for checking it out so far. Much love to you. Cheers.